Welcome to Lithium Ion Rocks, Season 1, Episode 11A, Sweet Baby James Calloway, Securing America's Lithium. I struggled a short bit with a nickname or music uh, accompaniment for James Calloway. Uh, I just didn't know what to do, so I just looked up song lyrics with James in it, and here came James Taylor, who doesn't immediately come to mind when I think of James Calloway, but when I was listening to the words here, I just couldn't help but think how perfect it was. Deep greens and blues are the colors I choose. That's kind of like blue sky and green fields for lithium-ion rocks. The colors of Ioneer's logo are blue and green. And the name Ioneer is incredibly creative. Ion, lowercase, ear, you know, pioneers in this industry. And James Calloway very much embodies being such a person. And another lyric from Sweet Baby James, which uh, resonated, he sings out a song which is soft, but it's clear, as if maybe someone could hear. It is May 2nd. I'm here in Washington, D.C. at the end of the Benchmark Minerals 2019 Summit, focused on securing 21st century U.S. supply chains for EVs and energy storage. Very privileged to have with me uh, one of the keynote speakers from the uh, junior lithium development side, James Calloway, who is the chairman of Ioneer. And uh, Ioneer is the largest unpartnered lithium development story that I track in my Mr. Market scoreboard. And uh, James is and a, a very successful and accomplished entrepreneur in a whole host of industries, in addition to being one of the founders and former chairman and still significant shareholder in Oracobre. So let me start, uh, James, by why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background first as an entrepreneur and a project developer and what from those experiences you kind of bring from a perspective to the issues that were addressed uh, today at this conference. Well, first of all, it's great to be with you t today and uh, it's been quite a fantastic conference here in Washington. A lot of great people together, both from the government side and from industry, and I think it was a, a, an outstanding conversation. We can talk about that more, but just quickly by way of background, uh, you know, I, I've spent my entire life actually building companies from scratch. I came out of Oxford and started my first company, which is Manned Space Flight Company, and ultimately sold that to Martin Marietta, and then uh, had a series of companies, including a stint with my twin brother building a, a NASDAQ uh, oil and gas exploration company. And then in 2000, I basically started to work with a, as a chairman of a, a private uh, software company. We became the world's leader in, in uh, legal operations software and sold that company to a large public Dutch company for a lot of money. And uh, then uh, I got committed to really thinking about a clean future for the world and uh, uh, was uh, thinking about... Uh, electric propulsion back in uh, 2007 and uh, that led me to think about batteries and that led me to not know how to invest in batteries and led me to the common denominator that I discovered in my work which was lithium and uh, I was very fortunate to be able to make a, a material investment in a small very small 26 million dollar market cap company at the time or a Cobre and at the same time become its chairman and work with Richard Sevel and the wonderful team that we built at uh, at Aura Cobre to you know bring online uh, all our Oz. and then and uh, a few years ago, three years ago, I retired from uh, Aura Cobre, and uh, and about six months later, uh, was contacted about this very unusual deposit in Nevada, uh, and my first reaction was, oh my God, it's a lithium clay. I'm not interested because I, I still think that lithium clays are very challenging to economically produce lithium from. 
but there was something different in the uh, the iron ear deposit at Rhyolite Ridge that caught my eye, which was a deposit that there was a subsection of the overall lithium uh, section that was a borosilicate. It wasn't a clay deposit at all. It was a lithium and boron strata about 25 to 30 meters thick that covered the whole area. And my my technical experts suggested that 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 was fundamentally different than lithium clays, and which got my interest. And uh, after much work and asking for uh, technical reviews and and processing test work, they convinced me that uh, that this was fundamentally important. And I made a significant investment in in Iron Ear, and and been the chairman now for two and a half years building the next great lithium operation, in my opinion, in the United States. That's great. In addition to uh, Iron Ear today, you're also working uh, through a private company uh, building solar power uh, in South America, right? So you, you're very practiced uh, in, in South America, uh, but also here in the U.S., what I, uh, having observed and been in this industry a very long time, uh, Oracobre in Argentina building something, you know, under the Kirchner regime, the capital structure of Oracobre is, is fantastic. You know, having brought in, you know, Japanese partners, 70-30 debt equity, 4.5% uh, interest rate in the original funding, and you've also had further success in the most recent uh, hydroxide Plant, and I know that was uh, uh, you, you, you. You had left by by, by that point, yes. but um, Oracobre in general, in, in a lot of the discussion in Washington, has been focused on uh, you know obviously securing uh, raw material supply in the United States, but a, a lot was somewhat dysfunction in the capital markets, both on a debt and equity side. You uh, in Argentina with Japanese partners successfully um, s managed to project finance something with a capital structure that should be the envy of almost any junior development company. So what from that experience, uh, which was largely Japanese, but in, in other cases, mm -hmm. Chinese companies or Korean companies, um, you know, fund these projects. You mentioned in your, it would be great if you could speak a little bit about what you spoke about today. There were Chatham House rules here, which we very much uh, are abiding by in this podcast, but uh, you have free reign to kind of talk about what you spoke about there. But one of those things was that, you know, there's an unlevel playing field for juniors, you know, vis-a-vis -vis capital structures like you were able to put together in, in Oracobre. So just share with us some of what you shared with uh, the audience here. Great. Well, uh, you know, let me just say that, uh, uh, you know, I've got to give all the credit to Richard Seville and the management team at uh, Oracobre. Uh, I played a, a role in working with them in, in the, you know, getting the, the, the significant financing from the, the Japanese, but, you know, I really need to give first credit to, to Richard uh, and the team. But uh, uh, I did learn a lot from that experience, and, you know, one of the things that I realized <clears throat> is that in, in the uh, Asian countries, particularly Japan, Korea, and, and increasingly, of course, China, that the, 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 the governments of those countries are working hand in glove with the industries of those countries to, to establish secure supply chains for critical materials related to this massive new industry of electric propulsion and mass storage. And, you know, I think that uh, uh, one of the key points I was trying to get across is that there's nothing bad about this except that if the United States thinks that they're going to be competitive with those uh, those countries uh, with pure uh, free enterprise, uh, I think they're going to find out that that's not going to work very well and that the, the capital cost in the United States, if you use U.S. funding, is considerably more expensive than in the Asian counterparts. And that, that creates a competitive disadvantage for the United States that I think we need to be honest about. Now look, if we all decide 
you know, Howard, that that that's just the way it is, and that you know we're going to we're going to fight it out strictly on the basis of you know innovation and other things. Then then fine, I, I can accept that as a as an alternative view, but I think that we should not do that uh, without at least being honest about what the Asian countries are doing to provide massive subsidies and support for this emerging industry. Okay, great. So th this conference had some 130 attendees or, or so. I was in the audience, and there were State Department officials, White House officials, Department of Defense, Commerce, I think even Department of Energy. Uh, Alaska Senator Murkowski made a cameo uh, right before um, uh, Simon's presentation and announced that she's introducing legislation, uh, which was announced today. I think Reuters reported about that. There was also some talk about a, a bill that Marco Rubio from Florida kind of introduced. So what, and you had a bunch of meetings with a number of these groups without going into the specifics of those. I mean, what were your takeaways, I guess, just about this event, which is, I think is the first of, you, you know, more of this type of education process, but how would you assess yeah. um, the, the temperature here? And you also yeah. uh, talked about a certain specific policy ideas, which uh, if you could talk about those, that would be great. Well, let me just say that uh, uh, I, I was impressed, and as a general proposition, I was very impressed with the, the candid nature of the conversations between industry leaders and, and, the, and the government. I thought that the, I was pleased by the intensity of the interest in this question about leveling the playing field and making this United States more, uh, less dependent actually on international supply exclusively. Uh, and I think that uh, the challenge gets to putting, you know, substantive meat behind uh, those objectives. So I think everyone agrees that responsible but rapid permitting needs to be addressed. I think Murkowski's uh, bill clearly addresses that. Uh, you know, that, that the government can be actively involved in helping to, you know, encourage these type of developments for the security of the country. Where the, unfortunately though, uh, while there seemed to be a, an awareness uh, and a recognition that we need to have more support from the government in terms of various possible forms of enhancing the financing of these projects, de, mo de novo projects in the United States. There was, uh, uh, and, and, and I think there was support for the idea of that, by the way, but there really wasn't, there really weren't any known sources for that kind of support. Um, and so there was, there were, there were clearly uh, the authorities existed in the U.S. government to help these projects, but those those authorities were not funded. And I think that's that's a, a big problem because the in in the Asian countries there's the authorities there's the authority to do that and there's the resources to boot. And so I think that. Uh, one of the interesting broad outcomes of this is I think, I think the, the government probably left wanting to work a little harder to try to see if there were ways in, in a, in a, in a, in, you know, appropriate to the United States to provide some kind of, 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 of enhancements to, to help these projects. And look, this can come in a variety of formats. Uh, you could have, for instance, uh, simple things like in the state sales tax abatements like we have all over the world with VAT re re returned. Uh, we could have rapid uh, permitting, for instance, though it needs to be done responsibly because there was a strong consensus that we needed to build our infrastructure in, a res in an environmentally responsible way, and we certainly agree with that at Ioneer. We're very committed to that. But I think that... Uh, you know, there could be a consideration, for instance, of creating ITC investment tax credits for U.S. projects, kind of like how they've done to stimulate the renewable energy industry. 
because these are very capital intensive projects like renewable energy, by the way. Uh, and so that's a possibility. And then, of course, putting some teeth behind the, uh, the desire to have a critical materials, uh, strengthening our critical materials. Uh, and, and, and I think we're going to be seeing some really encouraging results coming out of the government that are at least uh, rhetorically supportive of what this is about. And the question is, is there going to be you know, concrete substance that really helps the juniors that are really de really leading the way in developing these capabilities, like the people at Piedmont and certainly at Ioneer, you know, with really quality opportunities, are they going to get substance or is it going to be mainly, you know, rhetorical support? And I, I, I don't know the answer to that question yet, but this, this is the first conference where I felt like the, the issues were on the table, people were having candid and frank conversations, and I think there's a general consensus we need to do something a little bit stronger than we've been doing to help this out. I agree. I've been uh, very much a strong advocate of uh, American, you know, uh, projects and American supply. I think this is a bipartisan issue. I mean, Senator Murkowski is a Republican. Um, the Energy Committee that she's on is one of the most nonpartisan committees. Right. But Marco Rubio is a Republican. Lamar Alexander is a Republican. So they've introduced, like, rational, not Green New Deal type mm -hmm. legislation, but you know, it, it's it's part of the dialogue now as we're running up to the election kind of next year, but um, I think there's, we're starting to get recognition, but actual policies, I looked up uh, before this conference in 2009-10 when Obama had his uh, Recovery Act that the Department of Energy did do these credit enhancements or direct loans, but they were mostly for solar, for wind, for yeah. geothermal. In some cases, you know, Fisker didn't work out or Solyndra didn't work out, but, you know, Tesla got funded and it was repaid, right? Sure. And uh, um, I think Nissan got funded and was repaid. Well, the majority of the, the majority, vast majority of those projects that were were funded uh, or uh, were there loan guarantees and the vast majority of them did pay out, okay, and return the capital. It was just Solyndra particularly, you know, really was a big blow. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure how well vetted Solyndra was. And, and it's not important. And by the way, one of the things that was really interesting about the conversations today is it really, we didn't spend a lot of time today talking about the environmental cause. I think there was a understanding that, you know, the green revolution is is a is going to improve the environment. But this was really a much more practical conversation about the, 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 the emerging industries that are going to drive the industrialization for the next 20, 30 years. And a fear, a real, and they should be concerned, a fear that if the United States doesn't get its act together, it could find itself in a pinch and not be competitive with its Asian counterparts in this revolution. And it, it was very practical in this sense. And by the way, I think that, that, that the practical nature of it uh, is where there was common ground. That was the place where Republicans and Democrats should be able to talk to each other. We want jobs. We want high-quality industries in our country. And if we're not careful here, we could find ourselves on the short end of a stick. And I think that's, that was, if there was a theme today, it was... You know, we didn't spend a lot of time having, this wasn't a green movement conference. This was a industrial conference about these, these new industries of electric propulsion, uh, renewable power, and, and mainly about electric propulsion. I mean, we had a guy talking for, you know, a long time about like uh, a fantastic conversation about uh, uh, mass transit and buses and how revolutionary electric propulsion is for buses in the United States. I mean, this, this cuts across all different political perspectives, et cetera. This is about business, and, and we need to be aggressive in, in seizing this opportunity because we are the most innovative country in the world, but we are not the most innovative in terms of our overall industrial thinking. And we are getting run over, in my opinion, by the Asians because of our lack of focus on what we're doing.
I've thought all along, I mean, uh, this is a make America great again industry. I mean, if you look at Tesla and what they're doing, this is high-end manufacturing uh, in America. It's good jobs. Mm -hmm. And I was hopeful when uh, Elon Musk's uh, partner at PayPal, Peter Thiel, you know, was on Trump's advisory committee early on in the administration, and they were talking about an infrastructure deal at that time that, you know, have charging stations as part of a highway bill. I think there's a lot of room for common ground here, mm -hmm. uh, but politics has obviously gotten in the way. What's interesting to some degree is that, uh, uh, you know, Trump is pro-mining, you know, Obama was anti-mining, right? So you, you had wind and solar and you had subsidies for projects like that, but when it came to the raw materials in, in the Trump administration, it's kind of the other way around. But uh, like I said, I think this is an industry where with Tesla, you know, we have real, you know, leadership, industry leadership, mm -hmm. but, and some obviously subsidies through the, um, you know, the, the EV, you know, $7,500, mm -hmm. you know, yep. credit, but not in an organized way that China and, and Korea and, and Japan are doing. So I think there is, I'm not a huge proponent overall of government-funded, uh, you know, activity, and, and I'm not even so much, I think the, the issue is really maybe on the permitting, you know, and again, I think the, the credit enhancements, there's just not debt available for mining projects. Regular banks don't, mm -hmm. uh, they barely lend even to a, a copper project, right? So when you don't have a long history of finance, like in lithium, and you don't have a forward market, there is a, a market disconnect that, uh, a government agency or can help. So this is not like venture capital that we're looking at. Like the private market could, uh, you know, could address this with just a little bit of, uh, you know, assistance. Well, these are very capital intensive projects and these have to be project financed in one way or the other. Uh, these aren't, you know, uh, like you said, these are not, you know, let's go throw $5 million at a, at a innovative idea in a, in a research lab and hope it comes out something great. These are the projects that need to be financed are high quality, high return projects in the United States. And we need to be very careful not to have a Solyndra. We need to have, we need to have good screening methods. There needs to be very substantial private sector investment in all of these projects. So there's no doubt about the fact that we're not talking about the government coming in here and funding all of this. That would be a strategic error, okay? But I think where we can find more possible common ground is where the government plays a constructive role as a part of the solution with the private sector carrying the bulk of the load, but where they bring down the cost of debt financing for these critical industries that we need for this country. That's what needs to be, and that is precisely what's going on on all of our competitors around the world. So, like I said before, we can decide that we're just not going to do that. That's not our deal. Fine. But we need to understand the implications of that, and they are not good, in my opinion, for the future industries of the, of the, of the world and certainly the competitive position in the United States. Okay, that's great, James. And uh, in your presentation today, I think you, you put in four boxes, uh, you know, the buckets of, you know, U.S. lithium opportunities. Could you uh, just describe th that a bit? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there are different ways you could categorize things, but I think that the, probably the most useful is to put all the different known lithium projects into sort of four separate buckets, so the first possible bucket is, is the traditional brines. In other words, brines that have the chemistries that are similar to the ones in South America. Unfortunately for the United States, as I, I noted today, there's only one known deposit of that, and that's an extremely old and mature and really dying asset at Albemarle's Silver Peak in Nevada. It produces some, somewhere between four and 6,000 tons and it's many people have tried to find expansion uh, opportunities around it with no 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 favorable results and so unless we find some traditional brines through some kind of wildcatting i think that we don't have a great opportunity in the united states with traditional brines the second is is the spodumenes or the hard rock deposits and you know there we have actually a much more interesting opportunity uh, in the spodumenes, but it's, it's really very localized. 
we don't have, like in Western Australia, lots and lots of different possible deposits. Really, we have right now one possibility, and that's along that shear zone that goes through the Carolinas. And it's, uh, you know, it was the first production of lithium in the world. Those old mines are closed now because of the, you know, the 90s, because of the spot, because of the brines in the Atacama. But what's exciting at these new higher prices um, that we have today, uh, a, you know, really innovative company, uh, at Piedmont Lithium, is in there really drilling like crazy and starting to get some really exciting intercepts and new opportunity to, ex to reopen that lithium tin uh, 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 shear zone. Uh, and I think that that should be pursued with great vigor because it, it uses, would be using completely traditional, well-known processes to convert it into lithium, to lithium hydroxide. So that's a, a very encouraging bucket, the spotting, but it's limited. There's not a lot of those possibilities, okay, in the United States. Uh, then you have what I'll call, I don't know, you call it whatever you want, but I, I think I call it today experimental brines. You could say, you know, um, non-traditional brines if you wanted to. And these basically are brines that are not, the chemistries are not traditional. The, the percent lithium may be low or they come from strange streams. And really the two prime examples of that is the work that's going on uh, at Standard Lithium, looking at the Arkansas oil oil brines, oil field brines, uh, and it's a relatively low ppm brines compared to you know traditional brines, with a, quite a bit of contamination issues that they're going to have to grapple with. I, I'm really excited that they can, if they can see if they can crack the crack that that open and figure it all out. But it's still really early days and experimental in my, my judgment, um, but, but promising. And then the Salton Sea down in Southern California, uh, of course, symbol mining spent many tens of millions of dollars trying to figure out how to strip lithium out of thermal wells that have a higher concentration of lithium than any other thermal wells in the United States. And what it was basically, it would, the, the thermal flows would come out, go through the heat exchangers, they would extract the energy, and then behind that they would strip out the lithium using some kind of membrane technologies, and then it would be go right back down and, and circulate like a normal thermal well. They went under, they had, you know, Lawrence Livermore and, you know, big VCs behind them, but in the end it just didn't work. And that is, is dormant right now. And though, so that's the two good examples of sort of non-traditional brines. One clearly has not worked so far. The other one's being worked on, but, but experimental, and, and we'll have to see. Uh, and then the last of the four buckets that I talked about, of course, is a little self-serving because it's with eye and ear, but uh, is what I'll call the sedimentary deposits. <clears throat> and the sedimentary deposits are primarily... The, good, the two big projects and sediments are in Nevada, one in the north of Nevada, which is uh, being developed by Lithium Americas. It's called Thacker Pass. And that, that operation uh, has the problem of trying to separate the lithium from clay. So it doesn't have anything that it's economic, really, besides the lithium coming out of the clay. Uh, and... So far, a lot of money and a lot of efforts been put into that uh, by their predecessor could not find an economic pathway. Uh, Lithium Americas merged with that company and has been developing what they claim to be uh, a viable uh, path to process that using learnings from the phosphate industry. This is what they're saying, from the phosphate industry and support and help from their partner uh, uh, it, which is Gangfeng Lithium, big major Chinese player. And what they're saying is that they've solved that problem through those learnings and have a, an economic path to process lithium from clays. Now, at, at this, in the second important sedimentary deposit, which is at similar development stage is, is theirs, uh, is Ioneer's Rhyolite Ridge, which is my focus. And we, we like them, 
at Thacker Pass have a massive amount of lithium in clay, about 300 million tons of it, by the way. But our judgment, based on all our metallurgical work and test work that we've done so far, we do not think that at this point we see a critical path to producing it economically from the clays. And so our plan in our work is to mine it, because it sits on top of our key strata, and put it next to the stockpile of the, you know, the overburden, and hope that Lithium Americas actually demonstrates this technology which we're waiting to see. If they do, of course, we will obviously be pulling that clay out and processing it if it's economic. But our focus is on a, a sediment that actually sits, it's sandwiched between clays, and it's a borosilicate called cerulcite. It's very, actually very low, and I want to emphasize, extremely low in clay content, this 20 to 30 meter thick section, but it's very high in lithium and very high in boron. And it turns out when we put that under a standard sulfuric acid leach, we have a very high recovery of both the boron and the lifting. Over 90% of what's in the rock comes out into solution. And once it's out in solution, we use standard procedures that are all very familiar to the brine world to first strip out and, and, and create a very large amount of boric acid crystals, about 200,000 tons a year of boric acid crystals. This is, by the way, similar to the total Rio Tinto production, current production of, of boric acid and about 20 to 22,000 tons of lithium carbonate. And because the boric acid is such a valuable, uh, large part of our production, and it's an industrial material that's used in you know, 130 different applications, we can sell that material readily into the market and use that, that, the value of that to offset the total cost. And when we do that, take that offset credit, we think that our lithium 20,000 tons is going to be able to be produced in the United States for about $2,000 a ton, which would put us at the bottom of the cost curve. So those, there's some other little things going on and ideas floating around, but basically those are the opportunities we currently have in the United States. We should be pursuing, the, in my summary, we should be absolutely pursuing the, 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 the shear zone over in the Carolinas that Piedmont's working on. That's very important. And we definitely should be pursuing aggressively the development of Ioneer's uh, Cerulcite facilities because those are our two low-hanging low fruits that, that can be readily done and, and executed with reasonable capital and get high returns. So to me, that's step one. Everything after that, we'll see. That sounds great. Uh, we would like to go in greater detail into the Ionia project in, in future podcast. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, Ionia has the largest market cap, some $180, 200000000 million or so U.S. US um, and it has it raised uh, it, very important to, in the same way that Oracobre uh, I, I was joking with James, I call him capital structure, Callaway, uh, <laughs> that he put his own money, three, four million dollars in about two and a half years ago, became chairman, helped bring in um, Rio and uh, ex Shell. Uh, is that right? Or yeah, the, the, the president of Shell Oil and, uh, and the former uh, CEO of, of Rio Tinto Minerals and Mining are on our board. They're fantastic directors and you know, serious guys that know how to help help companies develop. So, so a, a proven jockey, uh, keep it simple, stupid kind of insider buying, and then raised uh, some sixty, seventy million dollars at. Um, in hindsight, it looks uh, six hundred sixty million. You know, valuation. So. Uh, they have a lot of money in the bank. It's important in the bear market that we are now uh, who has cash and who doesn't to weather uh, the vagaries of the capital markets. But um, thank you very much, James, for sharing your thoughts uh, on this important day in Washington in which Ioneer, again, was the, the, the keynote junior lithium uh, sponsor and um, look forward to continuing the dialogue in future. Thanks, Howard. Lithium-ion Bull, and through our respective LinkedIn and Twitter posts, 
Rodney and I may share with our audience some rationale for a stock for which we have conviction, to own or not to own. If you agree or disagree with and act on or against the rationale of anything said or written in this or any other lithium-ion rocks or lithium-ion bull, that's your free choice. But to be clear, what you are listening to or reading is not investment advice and may not be unbiased. It should not be construed as an investment recommendation to buy or sell any security. Rodney and I are not registered investment advisors nor broker-dealers. Please visit libull.com for further disclaimers.